¿Qué necesitas? No encuentro el clic para... Ah. Thank you, thank you for coming. Um, we have today the talk of Dr. Gabolski. Uh, he's a Polish American cloud physicist. He obtained his master and PhD degrees in Poland in the 1980s. Um, he has been in NCAR since 1987, currently as a senior scientist at the Mesoscale and Microscale Meteorology Laboratory. His main area of interest include computational fluid dynamics and numerical modeling in general, and more specifically, modeling of cloud dynamics and microphysics, interactions of clouds with radiation and surface processes, and representation of these processes in numerical models of small scale dynamics, weather, and climate. He was uh, a member of the Committee of Cloud Physicists uh, at the American Meteorological Society between 1995 and 1998, and a member of the International Commission on Clouds and Precipitation between 2000 and 2008. He's a fellow of the Royal Meteorological Society and of the American Meteorological Society. He is the affiliate professor of the Faculty of Physics at the University of Warsaw. Warsaw? Warsaw, yes. Warsaw. <laughs> Uh, he served as a member of, um, sorry, Dr. Karolski published over 160 papers in atmospheric science journals and similar, num similar number in papers in conference proceedings. He served as a member of editorial boards of the quarterly journal of the Royal Meteorological Society, atmospheric science letters, Journal of the Atmospheric Sciences, sorry, and the Journal of Advanced in Modeling Earth Sciences Systems, just to mention a few of his um, qualities. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Grabowski, for accepting this uh, seminar, and uh, I leave you with the public. Oh, I think, thanks a lot uh, for the introduction. Yes, I. Uh, I am a Polish American, so I'm, I get the passports, which, especially during COVID times, is, was quite convenient to travel back and forth between the US and, and America because there were, of course, travel restrictions. So, what I will be talking about is something that I've been doing over the last, well, I would say, a couple of years, motivated by, by work we did uh, with a student that I will kind of mention a little bit. So. Uh, what I'm really talking about is this kind of a canonical uh, uh, development of convection during the day, when basically, uh, if you look at the, at the, something wrong with this figure, I think it didn't translate well. There are supposed to be clouds in this picture, but clouds are gone for some reason. <laughs> but anyway, the idea is that on the left hand side, it's a morning sounding. Uh, then the, when the heat uh, fluxes increase during the day, you develop convective boundary layer, and then at some point you should have clouds here, which are gone. I think this is the, 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 uh, the problem with the, the projection. But I have another picture from my simulations that illustrate that. Basically, our 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12 after sunrise. So you start in the morning, there is there is no clouds, and there are shallow clouds, and they deepen, you develop convective energies, and at the end of the day, they are just convective energies. And those simulations come from uh, kind of the canonical uh, setup that, that we developed with a group of people uh, about 15 years ago. So the point is that the, this Duna cycle of convection for dry to most shallow and eventually deep is the strongest mode of shortened variability of the tropical, subtropical, and summertime mid latitude continents. Uh, and of course, this comes as it's not a surprise, comes from the Diluni cycle of the insulation, a relatively low solid heat capacity when compared to the oceans. Because over the ocean, you get a, the, the solar radiation is absorbed over, over well, roughly 10 meters or maybe less than that. Uh, whereas, if you think about soil, it's just a couple of a, a fraction of a centimeter. So the temperature changes a lot during our over the land, but it doesn't change that much over the ocean. Um, and of course, this, this solar energy that gets to the surface is passed back to the atmosphere, uh, and it drives atmospheric convection. And 
basically, the other way to say it is that the solid, solid storage on the Duenar time scale is relatively, is relatively small. Now, uh, of course, the energy can be passed back as either sensible or latent. Uh, surface heat flux is latent means, you know, water vapor evaporation from the surface or evapotranspiration from, from, the, uh, from the vegetation. And basically, I'm talking, I'm thinking about the impact of this partitioning between one versus the other, what it does to the, to the dynamics uh, in the lowest uh, kilometer and then cloud. And as I said, we kind of start looking into that some time ago, and that's a paper uh, that already been published two years back with Lois Thomas from Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology and some of her advisors and, and collaborators, Tara, Tata, <laughs> some of you may know her. Um, Lois visited NCAR in summer 2016 and an undergraduate student, and I was asked by, by Tara to find something for her to, to work on. And I thought that looking at a uh, very simple analysis, remember she was undergraduate, she was really learning uh, atmospheric dynamics, work on something very simple <coughs> that she can do and learn and master quickly would be useful. So uh, that's what we did. I asked her to look at uh, soundings released from Pune, which is kind of on the western side of the uh, Indian subcontinent, but behind the mountains, which are kind of uh, on the, the uh, on the very end of, of western end of, of, of the mountains. And basically look at pre-monsoon and monsoon conditions, contrast dogs. And why why that might be interesting? Because of course pre-monsoon, it's very hot, it's very dry, the soil is very dry, and then monsoon comes and, and basically the situation reverses. The soil is, is saturated with water. There is a lot of humidity, a lot of water in the soil. So the boron ratio changes dramatically. So what I ask her to do is look at some soundings and basically compare pre-monsoon and monsoon. Uh, and, and this is basically the temperature profile, uh, uh, water vapor mixing ratio and relative humidity. And, and those lines show the, the uh, lifting condensation level. So that would be like a cloud base, if you like. And you can already see, I mean, of course, it varies day to day. So there's, there's maybe like a hundred soundings altogether. Uh, from two years, I think. Uh, and the idea is that, that you know, the, this is something released midday. So the convection is about to happen, deep convection. And there are some features in, in this, this data set which are, might be of interest. As I already pointed out to the cloud base, if you think if the condensation level is a cloud base, it's higher for Plimonson. Uh, that kind of makes sense. There is less water vapor available near the surface. The relative humidity increases kind of linearly with high, and you can see that it's deeper between monsoon and, and, and pre monsoon. It's shallower for, for monsoon. So, um, so these are basically the, those highlights that I would like to, to make before I go into details. Uh, and of course, it varies from day to day, but in general, it's, it, it changes. So, what she did, she basically ran a simple parcel model that rises, and you look at the K. Or actually, we call, I call it cumulative case. So, how case develops for those parcels. And, and there are some differences uh, in terms of convection. Of course, there is day to day variability. Uh, one thing that you can basically think about is that uh, if, if this is uh, surface heating, and this is just some simple sketch, uh, the bandara will deepen depending on the surface fluxes. We will get into this in a moment. But if you think that this kind of relatively simple uh, model of boundary layer, which is well mixed for the temperature, well mixed for the water vapor mixing ratio, this two will give you close to linear relationship for the relative humidity. And then, of course, you get three drop of steel above, uh, above the boundary layer. So you can actually take this, this simple relationship and you will have uh, basically one to one relationship between relative humidity and the surface and the, the lifting condensation level high, which involves temperature at the level, surface temperature, this and that. This is basically Clausius Plapagon uh, and the, the, the pressure that will decrease in the vertical in the hydrostatic value. So we get a relationship like that. And that's what Lois did. She basically took the sounding data set and plotted it uh, as a the, the lifting condensation level as a function of high versus surface humidity. 
there is of course some relationship, but it, it, it doesn't look very well. But if you plug this relationship, it actually looks much better. There is some offset which we speculated why it comes from, but that's not that's not something that we would be worry about. But anyway, we will get back to this relationship in the future uh, later in the talk. Now, to really focus what we really want to do is to look at the, so the idea is that you get basically the same energy that comes from the surface, drives atmospheric dynamics, but this energy will be divided between latent and sensible heat flux. So some very simple theoretical analysis. There are again, some things missing in this picture and I apologize. Uh, it's relating the, the surface buoyancy flux to the surface Cohen ratio. So, uh, so the buoyancy flux, there is a definition of virtual potential temperature that is missing over there. So the, the surface buoyancy flux, uh, which would be the surface virtual uh, temperature flux, potential temperature flux, you can split it approximately into two times, the temperature flux and the humidity flux. So that's, that's your buoyancy flux. But at the same time, the more static energy, which is basically the energy that comes from the surface, you can write it approximately in a form like that, when you get temperature and water vapor component. And then the surface more static energy flux, by the same kind of a way of expressing it, we basically have form like that. So this would be your, your temperature flux, this will be your water vapor flux. Now, uh, if you think about the Bowen ratio, Bowen ratio is basically the ratio um, between one and the other. But if you think about the buoyancy to energy ratio, which, which will be basically dividing these two, it, it looks like that. So it has this, this buoyancy to energy ratio it depends on the buoyancy flux and some parameter, which is about 0.1 in typical surface condition. And the Bowen ratio, this Bowen ratio is the ratio of the uh, sensible flux to latent flux, okay? So now you can plot this, this relationship and it, it will look, okay, this plot came out good because that's probably the most important part of what you what I would like you to, to get out of this talk. At the, at the bottom is the Bowen ratio. So it's a sensible to latent heat flux. So for example, here, think about the desert that you get no latent flux because there's no water, water at the bottom. And all energy goes into sensible heat flux. So, so this is, let's say, 100 or maybe even 1,000, or in fact, infinity, if this one is zero. Now, here is, if you think about the ocean, which has basically 100 watts per meter square, roughly, a latent flux, and then sensible flux. So this is kind of like the ocean. And that's the buoyancy to the energy flux. So the way to think about this diagram is that if you are with the desert, 100% of energy that comes from the surface is converted to buoyancy. So in other words, this is what drives the dynamics of the Bandara layer. Whereas over the ocean, only 10% of energy it comes uh, you know, out as the, as the buoyancy flux. So uh, that's why when you get only sensible heat flux, the Bandara layer can grow very deep. So over Sahara, for example, Bandara layer goes to eight kilometers almost the entire troposphere during the day. Uh, uh, wait, of, wait, um, yeah, 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 I'm feeling it here, so okay. I, I, will not, <laughs> I will not move anymore. Whereas over the ocean, uh, you get only 10%. So Bandera layer doesn't have strong during life cycle, but it's still shallow, which may be you know, a few hundred meters. Okay. So, uh, okay, clouds are missing. Sorry about this. Uh, there should be clouds here that actually boundary layer depends, boundary uh, cloud base depends, and there are clouds that depend. So no clouds in this picture. So, so that's kind of a one motivation to understand differences in the dynamics between this low power ratio and high power ratio. Now, there is another motivation uh, for my talk, and that is that goes back to some work that my colleague uh, Hugh Morrison is doing uh, in recent years, I would say that uh, investigates the role of the, uh, the cloud width at the cloud base uh, with the kind of a convex parameterization uh, thinking, uh, because uh, in his interpretation, and I agree with his point of view, the width of the cloud at the cloud base affects what happens a lot. And this figure is supposed to illustrate that. 
So, so you get situations with different, uh, I mean, very well realized uh, simple model calculations where the, the, the atmosphere above, above the boundary layer is either relatively dry, 40%, or relatively humid, 85%. And those dash lines in all those panels are the same because this is like non entraining adiabatic parcel or pseudo adiabatic parcel calculations. And it basically doesn't know about humidity of the environment. And then uh, there's the more complicated is the analytic or numerical model that basically not only includes the, the environmental uh, conditions about the boundary and the reason. Uh, to finalize, it sounds kind of strange here. It means that I will be switch off in a second, which I hope I will not. Okay. It's gone. Uh, so those those lines uh, not only feel the environmental humidity, and you can feel that see when you lower humidity, you can basically make clouds not go as high as non-entraining parcel, but also feel the the width of a cloud, and if if the width is uh, smaller as it is here, half a kilometer, kilometer, kilometer and a half, the convection doesn't go as deep. That's, and the argument is here that in simple model fluid mechanic view of entrainment, the entraining, entrainment rate depends on the size of your object. So if the object is large, then it doesn't entrain that much, or, or the effect of entrainment is not as strong as when the object is very small. And this is based on some old laboratory experiments and some theoretical reasoning. Um, but also it depends on the relative humidity. But the point is, this cloud weight uh, is important, at least in the simple model. So the question is, what really, what really determines the initial perturbation radius? What determines the size of the cloud, if you like, when it begins to develop? So. Uh, that's why additional motivation for my way of trying to understand it. So what I will be doing, I will be using two kind of canonical uh, shallow and deep convection simulations. One that goes back uh, over about 20 years, which is the shallow convection of the land by Andy Brown and a bunch of people who run simulations. And then a, a deep, shallow to deep convection transition that I developed with a group of people in, in the uh, about less than 20 years ago. And that's based on the Amazon observations uh, LBA uh, case setup. So let's start with, with shallow convection, which is based on the observations over the arm uh, in Oklahoma. Basically the Durinai cycle of, observed Durinai cycle of, of sensible and latent heat fluxes with, with those symbols marking the observed values. And then uh, the lines reflecting some or showing some approximation to those measurements. And basically, those brief the results. Uh, so, over there are surface fluxes to remind you. Uh, and then the local time it should be somewhere here. It's not, but it's basically how the bandar layer, basically, the, those are initial profiles, how it deepens. And there is some cloud layer here towards the end of a, of a day, you get basically a very deep boundary layer and some remnants of, of humidity. And you can see probably even better on the, on the mixing ratio plots. So um, in terms of clouds, again, surface flux is evolution. This is the evolution basic observation versus model. And, and here, the most important is this figure, which shows how the boundary layer rises uh, as the day progresses, because the boundary layer depends on the cloud base, the simulation is here and observation is here. Uh, so, okay, but I was talking about the Bowen ratio. So, this is what I did with those with my simulations. Uh, I basically remember this is the plot that I showed you before. That's the Bowen ratio versus uh, buoyancy to energy flux. Uh, so, so, the original simulations are marked as R. And, and those are latent and sensible fluxes from arm simulation. And what I did, I did a very, very simple trick. I basically switched the fluxes. So I switched, so this reverse arm, R arm, the latent becomes sensible, the sensible becomes latent. So the Bowen ratio in the original simulation is less than a half. I mean, it evolves a little bit. But in the reverse, it changes quite a bit. It, it goes from below one to maybe three or maybe four. 
So in this plot, I'm showing you this energy, uh, the Bowen ratio, the, the and biosy to energy flux as a Bowen ratio. So you can see it go from somewhere here, somewhere here. So you produce more buoyancy flux, which means that your bandale, bandale layer will, will should develop differently. And this is indeed uh, what happens. And now, if you remember this relationship that I uh, showed you earlier, and this is the evolution of near surface relative humidity in this original simulation in the reverse, it gets much drier because you, you don't get as much surface energy flux. And of course, entrainment from the top of the bandale layer is also uh, affecting it to some extent, but you can just assume that it's well mixed. This is the relationship that you get. So this is clear surface relative humidity, cloud-based type. So this you can think about this as a bandar layer depth. And as you can see from simulation and this theoretical line, which is shown here, it's really nice agreement. Okay. So uh, just to think about what's going on in the dynamic side, I'm showing you those those plots which basically shows how the velocity statistics within the convective boundary layer develops uh, and how it kind of grows. So I'm showing those lines only to the cloud base, so the cloud base for the R simulation is here roughly, uh, for reverse R is somewhere here, much deeper, uh, and but also you can see that the velocity statistics are different, are basically mean with those circles is higher for the reverse arm because there is more buoyancy flux, so there is more active dynamics within the bandara layer, and it continues. So this is four hours, this is six hours, basically the same picture. Bandara layer gets deeper, velocity are, 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 are larger because there is stronger buoyancy flux. Now, if you think about some uh, cloud fraction profiles, so this is versus time, profiles at different hours, and of course, zero is kind of somewhere here, so you can see when clouds develop, how they deepen a little bit, how the boundary layer uh, uh, deepens. So this is for arm, uh, this is for reverse arm, and you can see they, they form at the same time, and we will get back to this point. Uh, but the boundary layer is deeper when they start, uh, when clouds kind of show up. And then, of course, the boundary layer grows deeper, because there is no buoyancy flux, so the cloud base rises uh, more in this uh, reverse surface flux. Uh, and, and this is how, this is to show the virtual potential temperature profile. So it's well mixed and then the initial profile aloft uh, or close to it, I would say. And you can also see how it depends much more when you get more surface buoyancy flux. Uh, and then, uh, and, oh, this is the, just the relative humidity. And you can see that the peak is basically where the cloud base is, and the simple model kind of has to be brought in. This kind of linear, it's very deep, it's kind of no longer linear because it was cloud is clapping on the screen and not linear. Uh, this is perhaps uh, the point that you, that, that, that you uh, kind of, probably the best way to show it, showing the cloud evolution of cloud base as a function of, of time. Uh, so basically it goes up as in the observations and some of the previous simulations, even the numbers are kind of comparable, below a kilometer, maybe kilometer and a half uh, towards the end of those simulations. But when you reverse fluxes, you can see that it goes much deeper. Uh, so it's basically a summary of what, what I was showing. Now, uh, at some point, I was talking about the width of a cloud. So when you have this cloud uh, simulation, you get clouds at different moments at different stages of the life cycle, how you can calculate the cloud width, okay? The mean, the average cloud width. So I came up with a simple way of doing it uh, some time ago, about 10 years ago, uh, in a paper for oil like special issue with my, my students. Basically the idea being, if you would uh, look at the uh, kind of a cloud, this is kind of like a cloud base, a cross section, if you like, and you will have some points that are inside the cloud, and you will have some points, uh, grid points that are on the edge of the cloud, where the edge means that, that those, those points are in this layer is kind of expected to be width uh, of a grid increment. So those points will have no, uh, will have cloud neighbors, uh, sorry, cloud free neighbor, those points inside will have no. Uh, cloud free neighbor. So by, by simple kind of mathematics, looking at the size, 
ratio between those the area that 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 includes all the points, so that will be r squared, and the area that on, includes only points that don't have cloud-free uh, uh, neighbors. And, and from that relationship, you can calculate what is the cloud width. And remember, this is just for one cloud, but if you have clouds at different stages in your domain, you're looking at the cloud base, that will be some kind of average measure of the cloud. And of course, it will fluctuate from time to time, but if you average in time and you have ensemble, which I didn't mention, I have a small ensemble of simulations, that should give you some relationship. And this is what this figure is showing. So it's time evolution of this derived cloud width in uh, different simulations and basically snapshots from one member are those black and white symbols, the dark, uh, the, the circles are from uh, the the reverse uh, arm simulation, so you expect one layer to be deeper, uh, and then classes are for the original simulation, and then the circles, those color up as uh, symbols, are when you average over the ensemble and you average over 30 minutes with the idea of, I, I'm saving data every 10 minutes. So if you average three snapshots, the idea being that some of this. Uh, kind of uh, um, evolution of, of those clouds should go away. And indeed, it kind of shows what you expect, or perhaps you should expect, or maybe you didn't expect that, that clouds are kind of similar initially, but then they tend to be deeper in this reverse arm simulation when they basically buoyancy flux is larger and boundary layer is larger, so it's deeper. So basically what I'm trying to say is that that, and in fact, if you think about what, what would be the kind of a physical mechanism, what kind of a time scale you have in this problem, the boundary layer depth is really the, the only uh, length scale that you have. If you would argue that there, is, there should be some controlling factors of what drives the size of a cloud in some kind of an ensemble mean, if you like. And, and it seems like the cloud uh, depth is, is, is this parameter. So, uh, well, okay. The next step would be to, to calculate cloud width as a function of or cloud base height. Maybe I should reverse this plot. Uh, the point being that that for the for the regular R, those are those points. And again, I'm using only those dots from, from the other figure. Uh, maybe there's something, but not quite. Uh, in fact, you, you may say it's actually the best. There's more. Kind of the clouds are getting narrower and then the boundary is deeper. But there is clear signal in this reverse arm simulation that the clouds are getting wider when the boundary layer uh, gets deeper. So basically, those points are somewhere kind of towards the end of the simulation. Okay, so, so summary of, of those simulations is that surface buoyancy flux in the morning hours determine the growth rate of the convective boundary layer. Surface buoyancy flux depends on the surface bowing ratio and the cloud width at cloud base. You may think about this as the size of the subcloud layer ascent. That's what forms the cloud in this kind of a boundary layer that's being continuously mixed. And it seems to be increased with the increase of the boundary layer depth. So, the, the other thing. So, those are simulations for this non classification case. Now, I will move to the second part. Which is what happens when you actually mix the issue with the deep convection at the same time. So this is this the other paper <coughs> that I'm taking simulations from. It uh, it has to do with this data convection development of Amazon. From the data actually comes from the LBA project in Rondonia, and this is kind of a simplification of surface fluxes that were measured or, or maybe actually modeled to use. I don't remember. Uh, the basically has this increase during the day and then decrease in the afternoon and convection basically you start with this morning sounding uh, and then you transition from shallow to deep convection. So it's, it's, it's not organized convection, I have to stress this is to pick up the day when there is this scatter deep convection. Sometimes people talk about this popcorn convection. Uh, so uh, in, in this paper, whoops, in this in the paper, basically, I run a kind of a, like a benchmark simulation that other models with lower resolutions try to match. And this benchmark simulation, remember, this is, this is some time ago, 
concern in a very specific way. Uh, basically, uh, starting with uh, this, so this is how the experiments were designed. There were two sets of simulations, small domain, large domain. But the idea being that you start with tiny domain, maybe a couple of kilometers uh, on the side. And then after some time, you actually take this, uh, these results and project it or remap it into larger domain, even larger, and then the even larger at the end. So at the end, uh, the resolution increase, decreases, but the domain increases. That's important because the initial domain is too small to handle uh, deep convection. And also in, in, in the vertical, you start with, uh, with, with domain not reaching very far, but then you uh, kind of feel this horizontal level, and the level you add uh, these four copies, I will have another graph on that. And then you add some levels and you kind of move it up, up to basically 20 kilometers at the end. And, and this benchmark simulation, this one it shows, uh, those are, so there is no convection early on, and then the, the shallow convection that deepens our four is about transition from, from shallow to deep because you can see it, convection reaches about six kilometers. And those different lines are different ensemble members because they are ensemble changing at what time you switch those averaging on the mapping procedure and so on and so forth. And towards the end of the day, it's six hours, not on the end of the day, but six hours. That's where the simulation to this original paper finished, but I extended it to 12 hours, as you will see uh, later. Uh, uh, you get basically ambience and you get the cloud, and you can see there is some fluctuations because that just system is really not predictable. So only ensemble makes sense. Now, this is something that, that, that I will already refer to uh, the size of the cloud. So in that in those simulations, we look at the evolution of cloud width at the cloud base. You can also see how the cloud kind of cloud base sizes as well here, uh, quite clearly. Uh, but basically, you start when you start clouds about an hour and a half, they are really narrow. This is a relative scale. They make it then, then not a little bit more than 100 meters. But then they actually are, the, the diameter actually grows quite a bit. And, at six hours, then you get deep convection, basically between one and one and two kilometers width. Uh, so uh, basically, I, I redid those simulations, but going into even higher uh, resolution, because I want to look at the boundary layer uh, more specifically. So, uh, so I get only three domain, S1, S2, and S3. Uh, so domain uh, is, 64 by 64, 12 by 12 by 25 by 25, with 50 horizontal, 25 vertical, and then I run it only for two and a half hours. Then I do this remapping that you take a copy, insert it in, in here, and then average. So the, the new domain has the same number of points, but it has lower resolution. And you do it twice, 24, 25, two and a half, four hours, and then you run it on for six hours because the focus again is on this on this uh, convection development during the, the six hours. Now the same trick as before. Uh, you've seen this plot. This is the LBA versus RLBA. So when I reverse so these fluxes, so those are fluxes for, for six hours. And when I so the Bowen ratio again, uh, co coincidentally or maybe not so, is about roughly about half. Uh, but when you switch it, it actually um, uh, looks, you know, kind of like two, maybe three elements in the simulation. So there is more, uh, there is more buoyancy flux in the reverse. But otherwise, those are quite similar uh, conditions as the as this shallow convection. So of course, uh, there was shallow convection because the, the conditions were not such that you can go deep. Whereas in this uh, simulations, you can go deep even early in the morning, as I will show in a second. Yeah. Now, there is... Can I ask a quick question? Sure. When you're doing this switch, is this described throughout the simulation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So those are... Very... Initial condition? No, 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 no. So, no, no, no. So you start with your initial sounding, yeah. and then what drives the simulation is only surface flux. There is nothing else. Okay. So basically, so, so those evolutions are kind of prescribed. And surface fluxes are, I should say, that are horizontally homogeneous, so there's no, no interactions with land, nothing. And, and this is basically to follow these two papers with those procedures. So it's, it's, 
Yeah, so land surface would be quite interesting to have because, of course, you know, when the rain falls the next, yeah. the next day, conditions are different. And that probably has important implications for what happens from day to day variability. And I think some of the floods really make well, sense. Well, Frank Cedar and Mingus has done this. And she shows that, that it, it does exactly what you do. Yeah, say. yeah, and you expect and that. Day, the, the, the convection state, the reduction. Heartbeat of the Amazon and, and the next day precipitation depends on what happens. Yeah, yeah, and I agree with really that. And there is more, especially remember in the SAC meeting, we had a talk with somebody looking at the La Plata region, yeah, looking at the dry versus kind of patches out there. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Easy. Yeah, I, I remember yeah. There, there was a talk on that and then. And then, and then there was actually quite a bit of work from Sub-Saharan Africa looking at what controls organized convection. And it's, it's not necessarily kind of a, talking about the feedbacks from one day to the next one, but if you get the patch, that's dry patch versus humid patch, where convection happens. So I'm not talking about that. This is even more idealized here, but that's to understand the, the, the impacts of buoyancy and how it links to convection developing, for example, for the flat which we will get in this case as well. Uh, so there is another aspect here, which is of interest. Uh, this is the wind in the original hodograph. So this is east, west, north, south. So as you can see in this, and those are hiking kilometers. So this is zero, one, two, three, four, blah, blah, blah. So you can see there is a lot of shear. So that, in, in, the, in the other case, there was no shear. There was initial wave uh, in the shallow convection, basically to start, and then model uh, developed in some kind of a structure in the boundary area, but there was no much shear. There was quite a bit of shear. So, for example, between surface and one kilometer, it's two meters per second. The wind kind of blows from northwest to southeast, and there is quite a bit of shear. And why is that important? It's important because, of course, what happens in the boundary area will depend on this shear. And I will show that in a second. But before I go there, so I run the simulation, but you can ask how caves changes and and how convective, convective inhibition changes in this simulation. So, so this is as a function of time, okay? So in other words, how much uh, potential for, for convection there is. As you can see, even at the onset of simulations, you get already over a thousand uh, uh, joules per kilogram uh, of K. So it's significant K, I mean, uh, but, why convection doesn't develop, you know, right away once we start the simulation, and why it doesn't develop like that in nature? Well, because we have convective inhibition, which is the so if you remember that if you get your Saudi, so so this is uh, so this is this is uh, height, and this is let's say buoyancy. So so this is zero here. So of course we take a parcel from near the surface. And then it will have negative buoyancy, and then the buoyancy increases, okay, and then it kind of goes to zero somewhere. So this part of the sounding is called K. In other words, how much energy you can release. But this part, the negative energy, is called same, convective inhibition. So basically, to get to this one, to this reservoir, you have to remove this one. You have to allow the, the parcel that wants to go to the surface, from the surface has to overcome this negative buoyancy to get the positive buoyancy. So basically that's what happens in those simulations. And again, I run the simulations, I get the sounding basically every 10 minutes. So I can calculate the evolution of K and C. And again, uh, these two simulations, LDA and reverse LDA. And you can see the dash reverse LDA develops, removes the sim a little bit faster, maybe, maybe half an hour earlier, you get to zero. This is when, a parcel rising from the surface can get to this reservoir. And of course, because of the surface fluxes kind of wet throughout the day, the cave increases, but convection will not develop until you, you remove this, this, this negative energy that you have. So it's very simple kind of convective dynamics one on one, if you like. And you can see over the Amazon on a daily basis, basically, day after day after day, things going on like that. Okay, so you've, you've seen that. This is two hours, three hours. 
And I'm to at two hours now away, there's a little bit of clouds. I will show it in a moment. I'm only plotting it up to the cloud base. So as you can see, there's more vertical velocity uh, in the, okay. Now, I guess I missed, missed the slide. I should say, I should also explain that because of this shear, I not only have this LBA and reverse LBA uh, with those profiles, but I also have this no wind simulation. So I do simulation when initially there is no wind. And the argument is that with this shear, the boundary layer may look different uh, with shear and without shear. So I get those additional two simulations, small ensemble of simulations, which I call LBA no wind or reverse LBA no wind. Sorry, I missed that. I should say that. And then, and then, uh, if you look at the those uh, profiles of K, there is some impact of heavy wind or not heavy wind, which has to do, of course, how bandar layer mixes and how it deepens, and it has a little bit of impact on the also on the removal of K, but not much, but there is some. So now going back to those, so on top you get no wind simulations, which are perhaps a little bit easier to understand what's going on. But something similar happens when, when you don't have, when, when you do have the wind. Uh, but the, the main point in this diagram is that convection kind of develops in a quite similar way, at least from the vertical velocity statistics. Uh, and remember, that, uh, notice that this is just three meters, this is two meters. So, so there is, it really not only depends at different rates, but also the vertical velocities are different between uh, two and three two and three, but the difference between LBA or no, or no wind LBA is, is not, not that dramatic, if you like. Now, if you look what's going on in the boundary layer, it's actually quite interesting and kind of expected, if you like. So this is complicated diagram. I'm looking at the vertical velocity at different levels, so 100 meter above, uh, 200 meter below. So these four are no wind. And you can see this kind of expected, I would say, kind of hexagonal structures. When there is no way to get this convection, kind of like when you boil your water on, on, on the gas, there are those convection, convective structures. Uh, so this is, this is no wind, this is reverse uh, no wind. So you can see this, the velocity scale, the contour interval is the same. So you can see that there is more vertical velocity here than it's here. Uh, so this is with no wind. This is at two hours. This is at three hours. Now remember, I changed the domain. So this is this domain is four by four. I mean six point four by six point four. This is larger. This is twelve point eight by twelve point eight. So the scale may look the same, but of course domain is larger. So in a second, I will show you slides when these panels are appropriately scaled. Now, when there is when there is wind. You can see that the something that develops in the Bandara layer is kind of like the roll structures. I took this picture from the famous Mason and Sykes paper like 40 years ago, when they show how the, 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 the rolls develop along the kind of with some angle to the geostrophic wind. But of course, in the Bandara layer, the wind will, will change. But anyway, the point is that the axis of those are low, uh, roll circulations are kind of a, along the, the, the mean wind, mean geostrophic wind. So, so I told you that the flow is kind of like that. And you can see those structures and they kind of grow in size. Uh, and, and of course the reverse uh, LBA has larger vertical velocity. The contour interval is the same. So that's why it's kind of more visible here than here. Now, if you, if you would actually do the plot when you scale those appropriately. So now I'm plotting the same size here, and it's kind of uh, you know half of that should be uh, uh, should be this one, and this is two hours, three hours. So you can see that spatially the, the scale uh, of, of those structures increases, and that makes sense. Your boundary goes deeper, uh, the eddies get larger. That kind of makes sense. And then what you can kind of expect, the clouds will be, be larger because the scale of those eddies gets larger. So this is with those rows, and you can obviously see this, this circulation. This is when you don't have a uh, mean wind. So, so you start with no flow conditions, and you can see that those, those, those eddies get larger. So it's here, 
and here it's kind of like that. And again, uh, with reverse uh, surface flux, you get uh, more vertical velocity, which I already pointed out. So this is yet another way to look at this problem. This is really complicated, four complicated diagrams, but let me explain when, what I'm showing is this is no wave on this side. This is the, the regular wave, if you like. And uh, on the horizontal axis, there are three things plotted at the same time. Uh, first of all, there are cloud fraction profiles for each ensemble member. So that you can see how those ensemble members, how they differ. And so this is at our two, our three, our four, our five. Okay, of course it goes deep at our five. Uh, so this is LBA, this is knowing LBA, uh, and this is reverse. Now, uh, those are relative humidity profiles. So this one here is the initial one. Then this is our two, our three, our four, our five. So you can see, maybe, maybe I should put a picture here of this kind of idealized uh, situation that you have uh, basically a layer that, uh, that kind of has potential temperature, which looks like that. We, we are fixing it. Uh, people in the Zoom, uh, please be a little patient. If you have any questions in the meantime. Yeah, one. Uh, in the previous image, uh, the size of the plants, okay, in the different simulation. In these convective goals, uh, in the shear example, what is the size of the of the clouds must be presented because you are thinking that the walls are circular, but in this case, we are probably having large rows in one direction and small rows in the other one. Can be you, you just thinking that it's circular, that it's not in the well, shear simulation? So, so my interpretation will happen to look at those calls, and actually, you can see it in Saturday. They, yeah, that those are clouds. Actually, yeah, those are clouds. But I think this is yet another kind of instability. You have a rose which go like that, so you would think that rose brings kind of the let's say uh, air with water vapor close to saturation, but then it kind of breaks into individual clouds. And I think this is kind of um, yet another instability. So you don't have kind of a, like a yeah like a continuous I cloud. Am I right? Because you once you get a level of free convection, once you reach that, then they will break. So between them, you know, it's like a heavy tire of instability, okay? Then you get a warm fluid that goes up, and the classical picture, you get those kind of mushroom looking like kind of things. And I think that's something like that. But of course, moisture brings, you know, all the other things beyond just the heavy tire of instability, okay? So is it fixed? 
Yes. Okay. So 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 this is evolution in all those four simulation examples actually versus time. We're looking at the center of mass, uh, center of mass height. So basically, uh, you can think about this like that. that that, you know, if you get a cloud, which looks like that, so cloud based flat, and then you get kind of a complicated structure. You know, if you calculate the center of mass, which would be like something like Q, which is a total, let's say, you get total water here, Q times Z divided by uh, times uh, integrals of QC. So that's, that's like a center of mass. So if you kind of think that the, on the other, which is a little water with increased with height, so if this is the other is dead, you will get you know something like that. But I should draw it to this level. So your center of mass should be somewhere here. Am I right? Uh, actually, that's what we not the right way to plot it because if, if there is no entrainment, the, the water will increase in size. So anyway, the point is that this is this is the center of mass of a cloud. Okay, on the cloud field. So it's not only one cloud, but the cloud field. And I'm plotting evolution of that as a function of time. And those dashed lines are kind of just to help you to, to kind of see the difference. The differences are not very big. So um, LBA knowing LBA, you can see that you know clouds start at similar time and then they go maybe a little bit faster when there is no wind. Okay. Uh, but when you reverse, they go even faster because if you compare here, it's our four and it's here, uh, our four is already here. So, so they transition faster when they, when you get reverse flux. And that's kind of consistent with, first of all, having more shear, but also having wider clouds, which I will get to in a moment. So there are some differences here. Now we're doing on time, oh, it's about end. Uh, we are about finished, uh, just to kind of do some analysis. So now we're looking at the function of time of the cloud-based height. So, uh, LBA, those symbols, reverse LBA, uh, uh, no, sorry, LBA with no wind. Uh, you can see that there's, there's maybe some difference, but not, not very big. And of course, reverse gets the, the cloud based height much higher up. Okay. Uh, now, I remember, I want to calculate cloud width. So now in upper panels, I'm plotting uh, cloud width as a function of time. And as you can see, interestingly, when there is shear in those simulations, they start kind of similar, but now they really go up quite a bit. In no wind, they, there is a difference between uh, reverse versus the original. And you can see that there are some jumps here. This is my remapping procedure that changes cloud winds quite a bit, uh, but then it kind of recovers. But the difference is consistent. Okay, so now, of course, the idea is to plot cloud radius versus cloud based height. And as you can see, this is expected relationship that it grows. The radius grows with the boundary layer height, but the relationship is different between the cases with shear and the cases where there is no shear. It basically increases more when there is shear. And I still don't understand this, but clearly that's what model results are showing. Maybe the fact that when you get shear, that cloud they're, they're kind of leaning a little bit and that affects the design of the cloud. Maybe. So for deep convection, super bias flux in morning hours determines the growth rate of the convective one other layer. So this is basically to say what we said, the same as we said for shallow clouds. And the surface bias flux depend on the surface pollination. So if there is anything from this talk I would like you to keep in mind, this is diagram that shows how Bowen ratio determines the buoyancy to the energy ratio. So, so this is desert, this is somewhere over the ocean. Okay. Uh, cloud width of the cloud base, the size of the subcloud ascent. Remember, we started with those huge uh, simulations arguing that the cloud width of the cloud base is important because if you get a uh, narrow cloud, it will entrain more and it will kind of disappear, could it reach as high as that's part of the problem of the shallow to be transition. So the cloud weights uh, tend to increase uh, with the boundary layer depth and the relationship between boundary layer depth and cloud width is different between no wind and real wind simulations. So, so this is diagram right here. So the final thought which I think is really interesting, and it took me a while to understand, and I still 
get into the mass, I have some thoughts from Steve Sherwood from, from Sydney, is that uh, if you look at those simulations, I'm looking at those, I already showed you all those plots, but the point is that in all those simulations, clouds uh, show up at about the same time. So it doesn't matter what's the power ratio, but still the clouds show at the same time. So those are several simulations, you can see that they are kind of the same time, roughly, not exactly. And the same here, and you may see why. You may ask why it's so. And I think Steve uh, suggested to me a simple, uh, but very approximate argument for that is that the rate of growth of the boundary layer uh, depth, uh, PBL depth, uh, should scale with sensible heat flux because that's the buoyancy source. Okay. At the same time, uh, the change of uh, relative humidity near the surface. That should scale with the latent heat flux. Okay, so so if the lifting condensation level scale with surface relative humidity, then uh, you can think that, that the rate of change uh, should should be negatively scaled with the with the amount of energy. So in other words, I keep the energy at the same per switch. So the rate of change of so the change of the one is the minus versus the other. So, so that eventually should give you, uh, as he argues, I'm still not sure if they agree, I think it's more complicated than he argues, that that is one way to explain why you get this cloud storming at different heights, but at the same time, this is a little bit unexpected to me, and in both simulations. So it cannot be coincidental with something that I'm working on right now. So that's kind of an additional thought at the end of my presentation. And I, I took about an hour. Thank you for listening. I hope you know there will be more work in this area, and it has to do with, let's say, this context in permitting modeling that some of those processes are driven by your parameterization, because you cannot resolve at four kilometers. You cannot resolve what happens in, in early early morning when you increase surface light. So I think that's it's relevant. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rossi. We have a uh, few minutes for questions. Yes. I have one, which is I understood that uh, your, your fluxes are imposed and homogeneous in space, but when you impose the flux, you don't get the dependence on the flux on the PBA growth, which is essential because it drives the gradient and the turbulence at the same time. No, no, no. I don't understand why you say so. Why? Because when if, if you have a lot of sensitive heat flux and you're going to grow the, uh, the PV equity, you're going to generate gradients of humidity, so you're going to pull more atmosphere, you're also going to generate more, uh, more evaporation, which is more turbulence. Well, and, and so you see, when, when you do your experiments, in fact, when you reverse the evaporation, uh, the, the two fluxes, you have different growth of PVLs, and so that feedback. On the, on the fluxes themselves. And that is perhaps why you, you get the similarities of, uh, of, of, the, of the cloud formation because you remain too parallel. Well, uh, first of all, I don't think there are large gradients across the boundary layer just because the boundary layer is well mixed. So, yeah, they have to be some to drive the dynamics. Yeah, but but the inertia, the inertia of the system, so when you inject humidity, it gets distributed to a more or less height. Yeah, yeah but, that, but that height is determined mostly by the, by the buoyancy flux. That's the whole problem. Now, for, for my argument, when we actually did this, this, this arm case with interactive surface fluxes, the student and postdoc that work with Midetto simulation, they are published. They actually work the other way than you would think. If you have interactive surface fluxes, they tend to dump perturbations near, near the surface. So it's not, it's not a runaway problem in the sense that you will have interactive fluxes, you will drive more evaporation, for example. No, you actually dump because the surface slides depend on the difference. So if you make them interactive, they will dump perturbations, let's say 20 meters above the surface. So they're actually not as simple as it seems, and I can I can send you a paper that we discussed that comparing interactive fluxes. They, they, they have some impact. I'm not saying that they don't, 
but it's actually the other way around than you would think for the reason that I just, just explained. Yeah, so, but it's, I mean, I agree, this is very idealized, but this is to kind of understand the physics and some of the aspects of the problem, especially, you know, how clouds form, because uh, this is something, of course, we know how important clouds are for, for the climate system. And, and this timing, it, it was a little bit unexpected to me that, that, that actually they, it's, it's a deeper, so they, there are some other feedbacks, of course, if they are deeper, uh, they may have, you know, different amount of liquid water and this and that, and of course they may reflect radiation differently, blah, 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 blah. And then I also just come into play. So the whole system is, is very complex, but this is very, very idealized kind of understanding of what's going on. Yeah. So if I understood properly, I was surprised that the, the, the formation of the clouds is just a matter of the relative relation between the relative relation between the satellite and, heat and the, 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 the sensible is not depending on if you are in the cash, you are in the rainforest, you are in the city, and so on. It's not due to the process. Well, be, be, because the idea is that. Uh, basically, they, you, you deepen. So, so this is one very layer at that moment, and later on, this will go kind of like that, and this will get like that. So, it's uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm just surprised for that. It seems that it's independent of uh, where you are. Maybe it's a cold environment or a liquid environment. It's just a matter of the relative the relation between the flux. Well, this this case is both cases are kind of you know springtime, summertime. So, I think they. Surface conditions, temperature-wise, are kind of similar. Um, so I'm not sure what what role the temperature would play here. It probably does. Um, yeah, I cannot just think from the top of my head because the, the this diagram that I had at the end or at the beginning, this um, you know boiling ratio, the how you partition energy, kind of looks like that. Am I right? That, uh, I don't see any dependence on temperature over there. It's yeah. just this 0.1 parameter is the only way where surface temperature comes into place. But then it doesn't change that much. I mean, you know, we as humans live in a very narrow kind of temperature zone. I mean, which actually sits a little bit higher up, but it's still variable. But we go from, you know, whatever, 40 Celsius, maybe 50 in Primons from India, to minus 20, so that's in, in Kelvin's, you know, uh, not that much, maybe 30% of the of the entire 25%, uh, whatever. So it's still relatively narrow. Uh, yeah, but temperature doesn't doesn't uh, enter here. Of course, it, it does for the surface fluxes. I'm pretty sure for the same conditions, whether it's kind of five degrees or 25 degrees, given the wind, given the Saturated, let's say, ocean. That, of course, affects surface fluxes. But, but in this picture, that doesn't enter. If it does, it's some somewhere behind the scenes that I don't see. Clearly. But, but in terms of thinking on the tomorrow, the emission from the ocean, someone, the current results with less, uh, less emissions, what would be your advice to for the convection community community that we run a simulation of four what should be your advice about shallow formulas and uh, Well, I, I think here, that's already what, what kind of Roy uh, asked about. I think the, the, the memory of, of, of the system uh, kind of has two elements to it. One is, of course, obvious. That's the, the water at the surface. When it rains at the same time, you know, at one day, then the next day, the conditions are different, so the boiling ratio is different. So that's, that's one memory. There is another aspect, which I didn't talk about entirely, is that when the ballet, Pantare Lake grows very deep, then there's this evening transition, everything collapses, but you get this, what is called a residual layer, which is also important for the convex in the next day, because the, 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 Pantare, the Pantare layer will grow at the bottom, but at some point, it will reach this layer which has less stability than, let's say, the first day you're starting with. So that's another uh, feedback which is probably important. And of course, you know, you have to have reliable um, boundary layer parameterization, which is the key, I think. And there are studies showing how important that is 
uh, in, in places like, for example, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates, we have some programs that then are that I'm kind of tangentially involved with, which shows, uh, you know, this, this kind of cold pools propagation and, and, and things like that, that depend on the, what happens, uh, you know, the previous day. So, yeah. Any other questions? Lunchtime, at least for yes. me. <laughs> <laughs> we thank want to thank you again. Thank you very much. For Thanks for listening. Thank you, everyone, for the time. We can go and, yeah. you know, the